Okay guys, welcome back to another episode of Sofa Talks with Roshi Rosh. Today I am joined by me. <laughs> Literally, I literally looked yeah. at you and thought, oh my god, I can't say it. I told you. Oh, I'm, I'm joined by a multi um, award winning film director, Ni Tolawahi. Okay. Tolawahi. Tol- Should I do it again? You're good, you're good. Are you sure? Let's keep it going. Okay, I do apologise. You know, I did ask you several times because I was trying to yeah. practice before we started yeah. filming, but I, obviously I'm not great with the accent. <laughs> well, you tried actually to bring yourself. I did, I did. Anyway, yeah. how are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's nice seeing you again. It's nice to have you on the show, and I'm yeah, loving, I'm loving how you're dressed today. What thank was you. the inspiration behind this attire? Um, this is my normal look, basically. Okay. So, so we finished shooting. It's already. This is like the marketing sort of. This is this is me. Yeah, you know, the red carpet look. Yeah, yeah. No, you look very red carpet. Thank you, thank you. It suits you. You know the title I just gave you, the award-winning film director. You look yes. like an award winner. Thank you. <laughs> so, talking about film directing, um, you've recently had a film that's just released. Um, I believe it's called Miracle Center. Yes. So that came out on the first of January. Yes. Do you want to give us a bit of an insight into what Miracle Center is about? So the Miracle Center is a satire about corruption. <clears throat> um, it's set in a fictional African village, um, and centers around a school where um, everything except the learning you know, happens. So they've turned the school into um, you know, a business, if you will, um, and corruption is rife. And the title Miracle Center comes from a, um, you know, a cash scheme whereby um, students from the city transfer to that school um, to then sit, um, I guess, like the GCSEs type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but what then happens is they pay for, for the exams and they get straight A's. Oh. Um, so kids that aren't very academically right go to that school and they smash it. Right. Hence the Miracle Centre. Miracle so. Centre. So what city is this um, based in? So it's so, so we shot it um in a city called Ibadan, um just north of Lagos, okay. um but it's set in a fictional um village called Panya. Did you create that yourself? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, but incidentally, actually, so um, I think one set when I googled, you know, Panya, you know, on Google Maps, and there actually is a random place called. Panya. Oh really? <laughs> uh, what's a coincidence? So. Yeah, coincidence. So what was um the thought process behind the Miracle Center? What made you decide to, to write this short film directly? Um, so it's a feature film and what had happened was um, that, that, that was my seventh feature as well. Um, so prior to that, I shot a film in London and nothing else came to go shoot something in Nigeria and um, I wasn't sure what or when or how even. <clears throat> But um, the producer contacted me about um, a sitcom called Staff Room. So I got sent a pilot. Um, so I got sent a pilot script for um, the sitcom, and it's called Staff Room. It's set in the staff room of a school, mm-hmm. um, and it functions more sort of like a mini mart type thing, like a shopping center type thing. Um, so the teachers. Like literally you have stalls in there and they just sell sell food and um all sorts like clothes and that like to the students and they don't do any teaching. Um so I was quite um um so I was quite fascinated, you know, with that premise. But I kept thinking, so what yes, yeah, so what happens outside of the staff room? Mm. And then through a series of um of WhatsApp conversations with the writer, we then um then sort of like looked at the backstories of each of the teachers and what they could possibly teach and whatnot, and that just grew into the school. Yeah. And subsequently, after shooting the film itself, or while even shooting the film, um, questions then started um, like ringing at the back of my head, thinking, you know, so what happens outside oh. the school? <coughs> you know. Um, it's so interesting that you're saying that because that's how your brain operates, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. It's very so much. Ripple, yes. What's the next step? Yeah. So that ripple effect is easy. So now. Yeah. Um, thinking of possibly maybe doing a sequel or a spin-off or something set in the village and then that village might become I guess like the wider community and whatnot. Uh, but it's doing well so far right now in cinemas. It's in Nigeria, Ghana and Cameroon. 
um, it's been very well received. So I think that could maybe um, start off something. Definitely. So um, obviously Miracle Center is one of your feature films, mm -hmm. but you've been doing films for quite some time. So talk to me about how you got into directing. How did it, how did it come about? I would say purely accidental, really, to be Really? Yeah. Um, okay. um, so my first feature film was in 2006. And it's quite funny because I was the very first thing, well, 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 not the very first thing I shot, was the first um, narrative that I shot. So um, in 2004, um, I was producing music. So my first love is you music. You were a music producer? Yeah. I didn't know oh, that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah literally, <laughs> literally from the 90s, actually. Um, okay. Um, the garage era of like the late night is mm -hmm. you know early noughties. I was all over that. Um, I did like the white label thing. Ah. Um, you know, I've got some songs in a few. You know, on, 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 on like a few mix CDs on like the Anapa type stuff. Mm. This is garage. I would not. never have yeah, featured yeah, you doing yeah. that. So I was very much into so that. Yeah. Um, so I was doing um, so I was producing um, hip hop R and B initially, yeah. and then um, I did a garage remix. And then that kind of got me into the garage scene. Yeah. And then in 2003, I produced a song. So the UK garage scene was starting to pretty much die out at mm -hmm. this point. So it was like a, so it was a song um, that, that played the saxophone on as well. And then shot the music video, um, was, was 2004. So I shot the music video, that was the very first thing I shot. Mm -hmm. And um, through that process, I used to draw as a child as well. So, so I creative. Drew, I drew like a big old storyboard. I didn't plan to shoot the video myself, mm -hmm. but um, I couldn't afford to pay someone else because I was getting like my quotes and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so having shot that music video, I shot a couple more, I think. And um, I actually got a short film award for a music video. Oh really? Yeah. So I've had two I didn't know you could get a short film <laughs> award yeah. for a music video. Yeah. So I've never won a music video award, but I've won okay. two short films awards yeah. for music videos. Like, you know. Um, so off the back of that, uh, I was then thinking I want to do a short film. So you know, you, you know, want to do a feature film. Yeah. Um, and so I'd written something, and speaking to a random person, um, the question then was posting me, oh, why not go do this in Nigeria instead? Because they've got, you know, a thriving you know, film industry there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I went off to shoot out there right. in 2006. So that was the first time that you started, that you actually shot for a film, <coughs> a short yeah. film, in yeah. 2006. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of getting into, because obviously you've come from like the music background industry, how did you build connections with people in the film industry? Because it is quite, it is separate. Obviously, it is entertainment, yeah. but it's two different entities, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, because, um, you know, I guess I was, I was very much an outsider, really, and I still am that to an extent. Yeah. Really? Um, Even now, you're classed as an outsider? Well, I feel like it, really, so, okay. um, because it's, it's, it's something that I almost sort of feel like I wandered into. Right. Um, even though I've been to film school, like, since then, and, you know, I've done a Hollywood feature as well. And I've done, you know, like several other things, and I've been to um, several international film festivals, mm -hmm. and you know, I've been in competitions that like won awards and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess the fact that I sort of operate outside the studio system um, sort of means that I'm not maybe in the staple of right the in the mainstream. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Okay. But I think we're in a day and age. Now. I understand what you're saying, <laughs> but. I feel that we're in a day and age now where, you know, people like yourself who aren't necessarily in that mainstream mm. are the ones that are kind of pushing forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's really interesting and exciting. You've recently, so I met you on set with Force Paradise. Hey. I remember when you came in and it was, it was very intense. Very, very, you quite, you are quite serious on yeah. set at, at, the, at the beginning. I, I am actually. I was there, I was there. On Force Paradise, yeah. I actually worked quite hard to, I guess be a bit more personable maybe. Yeah. Um, because I'm literally I'm in there and I'm like in the zone. <clears throat> yeah, so um especially because I wear like several hats, you know, on set as well. So um, you know, I'm directing on Force Paradise of the cinematographer as well. I was operating and it was just basically having to keep, you know, in, just having to keep a lid on everything really. So <laughs> Especially when you're dealing with a lot of young <laughs> young people. Yeah. We was laughing and chatting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Force Paradise was, was actually amazing in the sense that 
uh, because you guys had spent was it a couple of months or something? Yeah, so rehearsing. Yeah. So because you've done all of that, um, you know, actors pretty much they, if nothing else, they knew their lines and they didn't have to think about it. And that was actually what, um, and that was actually what convinced me to come on board the project mm. with you because you know I've heard of directors um, going onto um, of like a long running say of like. Um, um, it's like a long run in some soap, for instance, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you feel like the person that is the least, um, I guess, informed about mm -hmm. what's going on, mm -hmm. and that was how I felt. Yeah, you know, because the very first rehearsal I attended, um, no one had any scripts, no one had anything, and you know, people were just doing their thing. And Sylvia took them away from us. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, yeah, you guys were ready, so that yeah. was great for me. So by the time we actually got on set, it was a case of. Um, you know, you knew your, your, your characters, or you think you know you know your characters, or you certainly knew knew like knew your lines and stuff. So yeah. my thing was just to help, you know, the cast find what their motivations were, mm -hmm. and like the character arcs and stuff. And mm. you asked quite a lot of um, thought provoking <coughs> questions on set. That's my directing style, actually. It's it's a really really interesting directing yeah, style. Yeah, because I find it quite weird when. When directors tell actors what to do, mm. you're right. <clears throat> and so there will be people, actresses and actors out there mm. that probably can just take the direction and just go with it. But for me, especially because yeah. I was very new to acting, I couldn't tell. So, so <laughs> one, so, so I only found out just on just recently that that was the first thing. Yeah, I've never done I, it before. I could not tell. But your your your. I mean, Sylvia definitely uh, mentored me yeah. in in acting. But mm. your questions. Mm made me really think about what I was doing and oh, how I was good. behaving that's and good. Oh, that, that's my good. tone and everything so yeah that's good oh, that's good because when I first because when I first started out um so my first two feature films um uh, I didn't have any training in fact actually I've, I've never had any any actual training as a director oh, really? um so cinematography is something that I've always focused on and you can tell from the quality of my filmmaking that um, you know, I know how to yes. do that part of things. Yes. Um, we're actually working with actors. Because um, my first feature film, I didn't think of any of that. It was a case of fancy camera moves mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, but then, and because I've written the script as well, mm -hmm. um, you then get you know actors asking you a question and thinking, oh yeah, but it's on paper. Mm -hmm. And then it actually took me a while to actually figure out that the trick is actually not what's on paper, but is what it is it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and you just um, made a good point then. So you've not had any directing training. Yeah. What kind of training do most <coughs> of those mainstream directors have? Is there some sort of qualification that they have? I don't think there is actually. Um, okay. So I went to um, so I went to London Film School um, on the MA filmmaking course. Right. And I actually finish it. It was bloody expensive. <laughs> um, As all courses are. It was, was two, this was two years. I think it was about sixty grand or something. Jesus, that is yeah, okay. So, um, I was hoping to get a scholarship, but I didn't quite get one. So, um, and I did that. So after so I went to, so I got on that course after I shot my second feature film, and this was a million dollar film. That was a Hollywood, pro, you know, <clears throat> yeah, that was a Hollywood film as well. Um, but I thought I'll get on that path because that was a good way to get like a really fancy agent yes and maybe like get into competition you know i can and win awards and stuff mm -hmm. um yeah but yeah but to answer your question there's no training really mm. for you you know um most directors just do um i think their sets of attributes that you need okay as a person and in my case um the fact that i could draw um you know i was I know music basically, you know, you know, know music does help. Um, <clears throat> you know, you 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 literally must be a glutton for punishment to be a director really. Um, Is that just being a stickler for all the details? Because even when you just came into the space, you're very much an analytical person. Yeah, I mean, that helps. Everything. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 yeah, I mean, that helps. So, um, um, it's just the, it's the, you know, because there are directors that are not technical at all mm. I haven't got a clue how they function because I'm you student. need to know what's going on <clears throat> yeah, you need yeah. to not understand how cameras work how the lighting yeah, works yeah, yeah you know um, I'm, I'm extremely you know I'm extremely technical um, 
people do say, oh, you're very analytical, you're very logical. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they're saying it in a negative way. This is the way you said it. Well, I don't know, actually. We're just taking it for what it is, you know. Um, I've got a maths degree as well, so. Oh, my God. Yeah, you what have you? You've done everything. Yeah, so that's kind of where, so it's that, so it's that, you know, so it's that combination of things we really, so. Um, so I just see filmmaking and storytelling in general as sort of like solving puzzles, mm. you know, and it's literally a case of, you know, you've got a story, it's a character starting from this point, trying to get to that point, and you need to find a thread for yeah. it. Yeah. And it's pretty much that really, and just, you know, uh, then expand that into every single character, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's why usually at the start of a process, I would ask um, an actor about their character. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, think you're that asking one, me. <laughs> yeah, and I think that was one of the first. You know, I think that was one of the the, the strategies, if you will, that um, that I've discovered actually works. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not quite sure where I got that from, but I've certainly read a lot of books um, on directing and working with actors, and um, you've got a lot of online resources now, which certainly helps. But a lot of it is purely from experience, really. So. Mm. Um, I've worked with Hollywood actors, I've worked with people that have never acted before. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, um, there's no such thing as bad acting, it's bad directing. Ah. Yeah. So, so it's not my fault <laughs> if I didn't look good on the scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, actually it's not because it, it, this director's um, it's their um, job. job to, yeah, to, to right, basically yeah. find it and kind of get out of them. Yeah. Um, you know, without being horrible or whatnot. Yeah. Um, and again, and you course, guys did it in a way without being horrible as well. <coughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, so it's it's you you you, you, you kind of find your, I guess, um, your vocabulary mm. as a director of how mm. to, I guess, communicate with actors really, and you know, um, I've seen actors that maybe after I mean, so I do have a process mm. yeah, that I've kind of tried. Yeah. So after every single so after every take, I speak to every actor and try to find out how they feel about it. Mm-hmm. And there's no point just simply doing take after take purely for technical reasons. Yeah. Um, it's an opportunity to adjust something in especially one of the actors. Yeah. And then sometimes I I give actors conflict in direction as well. Okay. Um, that's also kind of done, but I don't do it as a device. It's purely because maybe you know the conflict isn't quite working type right. thing. And it's a case of okay fine, this is what you want from this scene and you want um you know the opposite. So how do you help him actually get there? So on set you was quite um, a big character on set. Um, very much a big character on set. So amongst the the, the guys you was I like was happy actually. Yeah. <laughs> the guys were like, Yeah, and he's like the ladies man, he's the the big guy. Like I think they all kind of looked up to you and the ladies they all liked you because you're very, very charming on set. So um, you know, for me it was just interesting to see how you kept a professional head but also really <coughs> won the heart of, of your entire team. That's interesting actually. Yeah, it is very interesting, isn't it? Because we're still very much like want to follow your direction and do what you say, yeah. but we still built quite a good relationship with you. And is that what you do on most sets? Um, yeah, I would say possibly. I mean, that's not really something that I was conscious of, to be mm. honest. Um, but I think what was um, what was um, I guess very very different about Force Paradise. Actually, actually, well, technically, you know, everything was different because again, you guys have gone through. Um, um, the long rehearsal process, and I came in at the tail end. <clears throat> but um, we also had a three month shoot, mm. so we had a very long shoot, and you know, it was like a rolling, um, I guess, circus of different actors, really, you know, um, who came in to do their roles. And it was quite nice because you might work with someone for a few days and then not see them again for a month, and then they come back in for a few days again. Um, so it was a very happy set, basically. Yeah. So, you know, um, so I think that certainly helped. Yeah, yeah, it definitely did. So tell us a bit about Hex Studios. Hex Space. Yes, Hex Space. Hex Space. Hex Space. What, <coughs> what's Hex Space? Yeah, so, um, um, yeah, so my nickname is Hexcentric, which is a name that I've had for you. Where did time. you get that nickname from, Hexcentric? I was quite mad growing up. It's not, it's not obvious. <laughs> is it not? <laughs> it's not obvious. <laughs> But I feel like most oh, creatives, yeah. directors have a bit of a quirky side to them. I wasn't, yeah, see, see, the thing was, I wasn't, I wasn't always a director, you see. You know? uh, yeah. 
No. Music producer. Yes. But you know, <laughs> even before that, I was always mad though. Okay. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah. I was quite small as well. Right. So Is that why you was mad then? Because you were small, you wanted to be I was heard. just a knot, I mean, <laughs> just a knot with the star, so. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, uh, this is actually a false paradise, you know, story as well, because the very first time I came to the rehearsal, don't know if you actually, um, you know, if you noticed it, but the rehearsal studio is actually Hexspace now. Yes. The exact same physical yes. room. Um, so I came in the first time and I saw this amazing big massive space and you know um, actor doing all this thing. I thought, wow, you know, yeah, like, wouldn't it be nice to that we um yeah, wouldn't it be nice to own a space like this? Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that you just I guess speak out into the universe without realizing it. Um, and then somehow, um, you know, a year and a bit later, um, I found out there was you know a space available in Canary Wharf. Um, you know, like the lockdown had driven us all mad anyway mm -hmm. at that point. And I guess out of curiosity or whatever, um, I pursued it, met the agent, and somehow it worked out. Right. You know, so now we have the space. So not only are you a film director, you now have a space for creatives to come yes. and My create their own studio. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. So, so for example, if I wanted to come and if I wanted to film a short, I don't know, an interview or something, yeah. I would just contact you yeah. and I could get that space for a certain amount. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, we've, I mean like, we've done, um, we've done scenes for, we've done club scenes for a feature film in there. Um, we've got talk shows being hosted in there. We've done um, music videos in there. Um, we're now doing um, live at Hexspace, which is um, a concert type thing, like live oh, music. Oh wow! Film. Yeah, um, because obviously, because since we've got the lockdown, yeah. um, you know, everything is now being streamed. Yes. And uh, it's just a good opportunity, really. So, you know, I'm a musician. I'm looking, you know, you know, I'm, you know, I know a lot of musicians. Um, we've got five sets on there, or five filming spaces, mm -hmm. and everything's mobile. We can, you know, we can build sets like quite quickly. Um, so we built a stage, you know, um, before Christmas there was, you know, you know, we had plans for, um, a fashion show, so we designed the wrong way. Um, I mean, you know, you know, I, I mean, you've been there, so it's a really mm -hmm. big space mm -hmm. and, you know, it's really flexible, so mm -hmm. we can do it. It's great that it's so flexible. You have so much opportunity yeah. to, to do a wide variety of work yeah. in that space. So. It's fantastic. And you've just touched on COVID. Uh, we can't have an interview without talking about COVID, can we? How is COVID affecting you and your job role? It's actually quite weird because I would say that 2020 was my best year ever. A lot of people have said it's, that yeah, to me. It's, it's really, really weird. I mean, yeah. I'm somewhat, I'm somewhat um, you know, apprehensive you know, about 2020. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the apprehension comes from the fact that there's so much opportunity and it's a case of will I rise? to do the work yeah. that's required <clears throat> um, because what's happened is um, you know most of us have day jobs or something else that we do and it's that constant right you know it's that constant right race mm. you know you've got projects that you've sort of um, had on the back burner for years or you start something and don't quite finish it etc mm -hmm. etc et so um, when we went into the first lockdown I was actually scouting locations in Zimbabwe. Right. So I got stuck in Zimbabwe. I came back end of March. I mean, that could be like a film in its own right type thing. <laughs> um, so I came back end of March and I wasn't prepared for it um, because obviously the country had been, been in lockdown for about a week at this point. So you guys knew what was going on. So, you know, I got off the plane at Heathrow on a Monday morning and the roads were completely empty. empty. Yeah, Where so, is everyone? <laughs> yeah, so that went so that went on. Then you're now stuck indoors for a day, a week, and whatever. Um, you get bored of watching Netflix, and it's like, oh, I'm going to become the best musician ever this time, and that doesn't quite work out. And then slowly, you know, you've got unfinished projects. You need to finish. You know? And I mean, so one of the things that came out of that was the fact that um, Force Paradise had been completely edited. But because we were waiting for the pandemic to, I guess, finish, because we naively thought that it was going to be done by summer, mm. um, I then had time to just pick up all the episodes and just re-edit them all over again. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so creatively was a very good. I was gonna say it, it makes sense because yeah. I've seen what it was like before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and creative really, you know, um, you know, it's that it's that lack of discipline, if you will. Yeah. But now you're stuck in your house. You've got no distractions. Can't go out with your mates because they're stuck in the houses. You know. So, so you have yeah. no choice but to focus. Yeah. If you want to be productive, not everybody course, yeah. wants to be productive. No, no, true, true. So just basically, yeah. So just just hammer on and just get work done. So how is it affecting, um, you know, the future work? If you, have you got anything planned in for the rest of the year? Yeah, so um, so I think something good that came out of last year as well was the fact that um, um, people that were not otherwise were suddenly accessible. Mm-hmm. So you had um, really high profile actors, producers, et cetera, et cetera, like studio heads and distributors now running sessions on Zoom. Mm. and um, I was invited to all sorts of things um, whereby previously I would have had to maybe fly to LA and spend thousands of pounds on you know, a ticket to get yeah. into some kind of conference yeah. but now it's all on Zoom and it's free yeah. so a lot of conversations like that um, are happening which is, you know, which is great but on the flip side um, so work being done I mean like Force Paradise for instance you know, was delayed because mm. of the pandemic mm. um, so I've got a film um that would have come out in the UK, but didn't come out again because of the pandemic. Um, so since um, since um, so since the Miracle Center you mentioned, I've shot two other feature films, wow. and again um, they're both sort of in limbo really because we're not quite sure what to do with them. Yeah, yeah, I had to wait to yeah. see what the what the future holds. Really. Yeah, yeah. So and it's like and then like you know um, one day we're in tier four, the next day tier five, then yeah, tier twenty seven. Like, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. You so, just don't know. And that's yeah. the thing, last year, as you said, last year we was in that whole naive, full, set, full sense of security, thinking mm. that it would be over by summer, yeah. and um, yeah. it didn't. So yeah. this year, I feel, I think I've taken the stance where I'm a bit more like, I don't know if we're going to yeah. be out, because I'd rather be like that than expecting mm. to be out sure. and then be disappointed. So, 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 it's certainly like, so, so it's certainly difficult to make plans right now. Yeah. yeah. The, um, you know, so, still right. Is that? Yeah, you can. You can still write. So, are you in terms of like your hex space? Um, are people a bit funny about the social distancing, or are you having to are you having to implement anything around there? So, the, so what? So what's great about the the space with the fact that because it's such a large, you know, venue. So social distancing is something that you can actually build into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but something that I've been planning from I guess the onset was to do like a mockumentary. Yeah. you know, in there, and we would have had auditions, or some kind of casting thing, um, just before Christmas, but then obviously December, we went mm. into another lockdown again. Mm. Uh, so, the film industry is, you know, is operational. Yeah. You can film, you know, even with the lockdown. Um, obviously, you know, it's a bit different. Um, so, it's, it's, it's simply a case of just, I guess, having to, is working out how, 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 you know, how to navigate it, really. So moving auditions online, maybe, yeah, and then just planning as much as you can virtually. Um, you need to film the person. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that's what an interesting thing. I think the whole planning and prep around it. Yeah. How much time and effort goes into planning um, when you're uh, when you're trying to film a short film? Um, I think it's it's actually quite simple. You know, um, you plan to fail or you fail to plan. It's literally as simple as that. And um, by the time you get on set, really, you only execute, you know, what you've prepared. It's like sitting, and, yeah, you know, it's like sitting an exam to an extent, mm-hmm. you know, um, and you don't really want surprises, you know, on set either as well. So, um, so whatever you're working on, um, long form, short form, um, as long as it's narrative, you should have, you know, absolute control over every single element. Um, to just try to plan for that as much as possible. Mm. And what does your kind of planning process look like? What What do you? Is there any kind of hints or tips you could give us in terms of trying to, if somebody was trying to direct a movie or or do a web series? Yeah. So I think um. So I think um. So I think irrespective of what it is. So if it's um. So it feels quite. So it feels quite straightforward because you know it's a single, it's a single, you know, unit product, if you will. 
whereas a web series or something like serial um, you have blocks of it but if you still think of it so i see so i see you know false paradise not as seven episodes of season two mm. i just see it as one film yeah and that thread basically works out for me you know, i can tell you like details about all sorts of things um and it certainly helps so i think as a director certainly um you need to know exactly what it looks and feels like before you even think of before you think of shooting it not right. even how to shoot it so you have an <coughs> image yeah in yeah, your mind yeah, of you have the and finished product like yeah and you would have various permutations of that mm-hmm. you know and um it's only through that process that you now start maybe start eliminating things and um you have to maybe look at the maybe look at the story from the perspective of every actor as well um because the audience would only see the film most you know most likely from the protagonist or the like lead characters mm-hmm. you know like perspective um every actor ideally should look at it from their perspective um but a director you need to be objective mm-hmm. and kind of have like an overall like vision you know of the whole thing um, it's very important to just basically just work out how everything fits together mm-hmm. because they typically would be loose hands you know like in anything mm-hmm. and you need to either find ways of um of either fixing it or justifying it you know yeah but it needs to work it still it always has to work doesn't yeah, it, it needs to work. so what's been like the most difficult challenges that you've been faced with in terms of directing film directing um I would say for anyone actually, um, it's got to be funding. You know, um, yeah. Because it costs a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. It's um, 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 I would so as a, so as um, so as an industry, if you will. So I'm probably in the bracket of say, um, someone that should be directing features of like a five million pound sort of range, um, because you cannot outgrow. On that yeah. certain you know, bands, if you will. Yeah. So I'm sort of in You're that band, right? yeah. yeah. So yes, I'm sort of in that band right now. Um, That's a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, and what tends to happen as well is you know um, it's the entertainment business or the film business. Um, but what we tend to forget about is the business end of things. Mm. You know, so it's mostly, it's mostly um, you know, like writing proposals. Um, trying to set up meetings or like doing meetings so it's that business really and it's not something that um, I guess we enjoy mm. you know because if we want to do business then mm. we purely work in that space yeah you know so there's a lot of sales involved essentially yeah um, you've got to sell your vision I was going to say do you have to pitch your stories <laughs> yeah yeah in order so, to yeah, get the back yeah. in so I mean so it's constantly that really so I've been I've been quite fortunate in that my first two feature films were self-funded and that gave me the opportunity to, I guess, prove myself. Yeah. And um, what's happened um, is in the last, say, I've done more work in, say, the last, say, three years than I've done in the last, say, decade, like, prior to that. And it's because people now see my work and there's demand for it, you know. So, um, so I now attract things, really. So, um, so people are coming to you yeah, rather yeah. than you going to them and saying, can I... Uh, yeah, exactly. So, um, but I guess what's still missing is the fact that, you know, I'm not getting like, the big budget things. Mm. So, um, but that will come in, in the future. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah. The next steps, yeah. it will come. Um, but. You know, you know, you, you, you know, but irrespective, you know, yeah, like, it's a journey. Mm. And, you know, every project pretty much is a passion project, really, to be honest. Uh, so even if I was given £5 million, pound, I would still try to do something worth about 50 with it. Yeah. And end up getting stressed in you know. <laughs> <laughs> What's been your favourite project to work on? Has it? No, yeah, no. Are you just saying that because you're talking to me. I don't, I don't, don't, don't guess me. Not, it's definitely on. <laughs> it's definitely up there. Force Paradise. Yeah. What, what was the yeah, most enjoyable thing about Force Paradise? Yeah, because so I've done nine feature films, yeah. and you could say Force Paradise was the tenth one because um, because cumulative because if you add it all up. Um, you know, you like um, it does total into a feature film, and the way I planned the shoot was actually a feature film actually, and um, 
you might have noticed have you seen any of it or just the trailer the trailer okay. so what i've actually done is i've actually moved some scenes around oh right okay yeah See, yeah so, so <laughs> yeah so so from when you guys were from when you guys were rehearsing it okay okay yeah okay yeah. fine fine yeah so I changed quite a few, um, so I changed so, some bits So when you're saying you turned scenes around, so the way episodes were structured, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, so, changed yeah, that. Yeah, so, oh. yeah, so some scenes, so some scenes just literally moved from it I to five. I can't keep up with you, two. honestly. Your brain is constantly no, on the go. No, because it's what you need to do, because you look at how things basically just weave together. Right. And, um, and sometimes, I mean, this was done in collaboration um, you know, with Sylvia, because... Mm-hmm. Because um, I kept saying to her, like, listen, you know, you've written this, you've produced it, and you workshop this as well. She, she proper went to town with that. So... You came in with fresh eyes. Yeah, exactly. And by the time it was now shot, um, like any project, you know, um, some scenes were designed to have been shot at night. But because of the, the way the schedule worked out, yeah. um, we actually shoot like, dude, I'm not, I'm not doing the day, mm-hmm. but maybe one actor wasn't available, mm-hmm. so things got adapted and whatnot. There's a lot of things to take into consideration. Yeah, but, yeah. So for such a, so for such a project that had, uh, you know, a large cast, and I mean, a lot of the cast had like their personal things going yeah. on, really. So, um, you know, I mean, that was a passion project for everyone, really. So people were not working professionally. Yeah. It's just. You know, I mean, even though they were professional. Yeah, we was doing it within our time yeah. that we yeah, could, yeah. in our so, spare time, basically. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so through all of that, really. So, okay. So this should have been um, an outdoor scene in bright daylight, but we're now shooting in midnight. Um, you know, indoors. Mm. So we need to be adapted. That. Yeah. Mm. So things kind of moved. And when I found opportunities like that, then I then thought of what else could I do with this scene? Yeah. Type thing and. So episode mm. seven, you know, which was actually around you, actually. Oh, episode seven. What did I do in that scene? Yeah. So okay. So <laughs> so so so, so, um, so what I did as well was um um so for every episode, and this is just like personal things for me actually. So every episode, in my mind, I I I found um an actor and said, you know, this episode is this. Right. Yeah. yeah. That again. Their story. Just, yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So episode seven was yours actually. Okay. Yeah, if you didn't realize it. Uh, because obviously um, one of the culminating things that happened in the entire you know, season, mm-hmm. um, you know, past spoilers, was, you know, you were going to become a different type of person. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So there's a change that was um, designed around your person that um, was, you know, yeah, you know, that was crucial to the resolution of the story. Yeah. And that was why that whole thing was, I guess, centered around you. If you watch it and you'll see what I'm saying now. I can't it. wait. But if I didn't mention that, you might just watch it and think it's just another episode. No. Yeah. Yeah, but that I, was very much molded around, you know, your see, sense of urgency. What's annoying is that because of COVID, we don't get to have the screening anymore. So yes, yes, unfortunately, yes. I won't be able to be next to you yes, while I'm watching yes. it and go, Lee, that's a great job you've done. Yeah. But I will message you. We, 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 we could potentially, um, we could potentially do, do an online. Yeah. Like a, yeah, because I think it's important to do one actually. Yeah, so. because we work so hard and it's just, it would be great to have something to celebrate yeah, together. Yeah. And the actual feedback as well um, really does help because, because you've mentioned certain things, you know, like even just, you know, even just today, mm-hmm. um, that I was either not aware of or I was maybe um, trying to, I guess, experiment with. And mm-hmm. we have actually mentioned them, I guess, something's worked out well. Definitely. So I can do my work in that area. <laughs> Me, it was lovely having you on Sofa Talks. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. You're such an insightful person with so much experience and such good quality information. I'm so happy that you've been able to come on our show. You know, can I have that right, please? Yes, I'll write it and sign it. I still get my CV. <laughs> Date it for yes, you. Thanks. But honestly, you know, it's a real, real pleasure and a privilege to have you on this show. And we're really excited for everything you've got coming out. Thank you. Um, Yeah, thank you. Thanks.